Hey, John, welcome to the show today. Hey, thanks for having me on. Uh, give us a little background on yourself. So it's funny because I think my wife says it best. I'm a real estate developer by trade, and I've been doing that since before my hair was gray. All right. And now I'm a software developer, too. So she says to me, this is great. You're out of my hair all day. <laughs> Sorry. So so. You know, when you're doing that stuff, how do you even have an elevator script when you do such totally different businesses all day? But that's what happens with all of us older guys, right? We get to a point where we uh, we get into one bucket and then we decide it's fun to do another one. And the software part, like, you know, um, when you're doing the real estate development, the software helps you as one of those modern day tools that helps you analyze properties and make better decisions and saves yourself a lot of time as you go forward. So. I like both of those parts, but from a standpoint of development, we've started to specialize into renewable energy, which is a broad based topic, but it's something that hopefully we can add some real value for your audience today on. So what kind of uh, development or, or commercial real estate have you have you done? Give us a little idea about about that. So when you get to be my age, you have that nice big long resume, right? And it sits there and you, you've you got all of these units that you've done and all these projects. And it's sometimes you kind of sit there, it's like, wow, it's depressing to look at all that stuff that you did because it means you're old. But as far as what we've done, um, you, we, we're specialists in permitting. And then, and then ultimately we'll build our own stuff and then either keep it and rent it and cash flow it or flip it to somebody else who will take it from us there. We've pretty much specialized in the Northeast market. We haven't done a heck of a lot in, in, a, in a lot of other regions. There's been enough for us to do here over the last 25 years. So, but we're into hundreds of units, thousands of permits, and you guys know what that's like. Once you get there, you, you've been in the business for a long time and the numbers seem high, but we're actually um, a fairly small company in, in retrospect. What does it mean to be a specialist in permits? I'm not sure I've heard that, but it sounds like come some kind of like, you know, obscure niche that somehow is profitable. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, no, you're right. So when you when you're in the Northeast, there's a lot of big fish. And one of the things that happens is everybody needs permitted property to build on. And these tend to be not in my backyard. They call it and the anagram is NIMBY. They're not in my backyard states. So because of the way that towns in the Northeast are set up. You usually have a regional or a town zoning board and there's town government that you have to go to. You're not dealing necessarily with big city or county governments that you might have other places. So you're, you're dealing with individual municipalities that you have to be able to build relationships with and understand their zoning codes. And you can have one, you can have a state like Connecticut with 160 towns, each one has their own zoning code. So when you try to permit in one town, you might be able to get something approved, but you can't in another. And the business has kind of evolved, especially in multifamily and development space to where you have to be able to know how to permit to keep your inventory flow going. Otherwise, because there's not as much property here to buy as there might be in other places. If you and I went into CoStar or LoopNet today and tried to buy a multifamily building in Boston, we would find there's hardly anything for sale because those things are off market deals. They barely ever pop up. And when they do, they get taken down by the bigger investors right away. They never make it to the rest of us. So when you can go out and create inventory then you become a what I call a permitting specialist and maybe that. That's more of my terminology than an industry term. But when you become really good at getting permits, you become some, one of the prettiest older guys at the ball. Because when you have inventory, every developer wants to meet you because you solve their problems of filling their pipeline up for their next projects. And as you know, right now in the multifamily space, there's a lot, there's a definitely a high demand and a large construction pipeline. And the way that gets fed is people like us in these regions will get the permits and then we'll, we'll flip oftentimes those to the bigger developers. Wow. So, so that's a specific uh, niche is, is the permitting. What, what kind of goes into that and how did you get into that? It's one of those things where you kind of just, it's like different parts of your career. You kind of just back into it. We got across the 1990s where we were doing a lot of building. We were doing a lot of building, a lot of retention, a lot of management, and then cash flowing what we had. We got into the 2000s. The, uh, it's funny, as I talk, we've survived three recessions 
and and we'll call last year the fourth right and every time that we went through one our balance sheet grew on the other side so whatever we were doing methodology right was was right but that that one in 2001 happened after the um terror attacks in on american in new york and washington so those were two big markets that got impacted and that little blip on the radar sent us in a little bit of a different direction to rebuild between 2002 and 2008 and then we all know what happened in 2008 that was a real adjustment for everybody and at that time we were lucky we just had a lot of inventory that had low loan to values on it so we were able to ride through that and we had sold some things in 2005 and 6 that had left us with quite a bit of capital back in in our coffers so we were able to buy low in 2010 and 2011 when things started to stabilize again but i date myself some but back then is when we realized when you go through those recessions a lot of times your value is in your property and where your property is and where your land is. We all know the location metaphor in real estate, but when you have land, you become, you have an asset that you can always improve. And if you like start to follow land through the development cycle, you might buy it for, from somebody for 300,000. You might put another couple hundred thousand dollars worth of permitting costs into it, but your entitlements, once you have it with the number of units you get, might translate into $2 million worth of value. So when you start doing those kind of ROIs, we typically can't get that if we just buy a building today. So then we're able to take that land and then if we either build on it, we already have implied equity, which the lender loves, or we can flip it to somebody bigger and 1031 into the next piece, which just gets bigger. So your business starts to accelerate in a hurry when you use all of the things that are available for you in either the tax brackets or in the in the permitting space to be able to just get from, you start to learn it takes almost the same amount of work to get 10 units approved as it does 100. Yeah, we've it's seen kind of we've, we've seen yeah. that as well. As well. I, I love uh, ideas like this, John, where you're especially changing the use of something. So, for example, uh, short-term rentals is a, is a perfect example of changing the use of a normal residential house, and therefore you create so much value. Taking a piece of land that has a duplex on it and rezoning it for a ten-unit or fifteen-unit. Uh, I love that. In California now, they're allowing people to, to build a one or two units and basically in the backyard now to help solve some of the uh, some of the affordable housing problems. Well, that's a change of use. And I love stuff like that. It's very. And so Garrett and I and, and our and Drew were constantly looking for how can we improve the value of the buildings that we buy and right above and beyond the traditional approach of going in there and you know making some renovations and raising the rents everybody's doing that but what else can we do i mean we've looked at stuff like solar panels selling electricity back or you know billboards digital billboards or valet trash or you know whatever selling back whatever like something something that gives us an edge because even 25 dollars more in in income makes a material difference therefore we can be more competitive and buy more stuff and that's very powerful so so you have done a bunch of stuff around making properties more eco-friendly or sustainable or energy efficient and we've played with that as well one of our favorite value add is is doing water conservation in fact we build it in every one of our deals now i mean it's expensive fifty thousand seventy thousand dollars someone comes in and replaces all the the toilets and the flushing and and the you know and all of a sudden but we we save like 70 percent of the value on water and we get that back and it's a meaningful value add and so what kind of stuff have you done or seen work that that we can talk about here today sure i mean you guys are on it it's, it's it falls under the umbrella of asset management and it's funny it seems like the most times we're all so busy that it's hard to really stare at your particular assets and figure what is it that i can do to make this better and it's it, it becomes a unique um task through recessions because as you guys know when you go through those you end up sitting around a lot <laughs> And you have to take the assets that you have and, and make them better because that's how you, one of the tools in your box to survive those. And yeah, I mean, the water, you know, it's interesting when you think about how people pro forma apartment acquisitions, right? And they'll sit down and they'll then, and, and you get handed what I'll call the funny papers. And each year there's a adjustment of 2% for, let's say, income and 2% for expense, 
right? And if you want to end up in a world, picture 10 years from now, look at what's what we're already seeing publicized problems of water shortages, right? You guys are so smart to move into that space because we could all end up with public water bills that we've never seen before in certain municipalities three, five, six years out that nobody has scheduled at all. So the more you can do in that kind of stuff is is great. On to the renewable energy part that you um, that you asked me about. So when you look at things like your tenant base, right? And you say, well, what is the ideal tenant? And so for me, the ideal tenant is reliable with payment, low maintenance, quiet, and signs a long-term lease, <laughs> right? So if we were to partner, let's say, with a solar developer on one of our buildings, and the solar developer comes in and puts on our rooftop um, solar panels, and we lease the space to them, we now have another revenue stream that we can generate as a property owner. And all we did is lease out more space and solar is the tenant. That's cool. I like that because yeah. we did look into solar, but it's very complex, but it's becoming the mm. operator, right? You know, like, oh, you got to right. install it. You got to done, then you got to somehow sell it back. But what you're talking about is leasing the roof mm -hmm. to a solar provider. I love that. And then, as you just mentioned, you have certain properties that you'll look at for expansion. So based on zoning entitlements, can we add development right units to our property and enhance its value? And if so, what's that going to cost? Well, what if we lease the ground around certain parts of our open space or our residual land um, to a solar developer who will put on the ground solar and interconnect to the grid? What if we do that? So those are options. And a lot of times we end up in properties where we have, let's say, environmental or wetland issues with setback. And we have to build, especially in the Northeast, you're 75, 100 feet away from any kind of wetland impact um, review areas. But with solar, you might be able to get closer. What if you can get within 50 feet? Because your impacts are not the same as a building. And all of a sudden you can start to cash flow this residual dead land. And we hadn't all thought of that until recently now, we have more incentives. So depending upon where you are, and if you're, if you're in the Northeast where I can speak to, um, the states are pretty good about giving us incentives and a blanket term for them are RECs, they're renewable energy credits. And what happens is if we, we or the developer hooks up to the grid and supplies power either to our building and sells the residual back to the grid or just sells to the grid. They can apply for and often get renewable energy credits in the form of kilowatt payment. So let's just say your tenants are used to paying six cents a kilowatt, seven cents a kilowatt for power. And the, the energy providers in the state say that they'll pay the the public utility will pay for us to convert to more green energy they might pay us five cents just for that now we can turn around and we can on our residual land create power for our tenants and if we can create enough we might be able to net meter meaning sell the power on site to our tenants for four cents a kilowatt instead of the six that they're used to paying i haven't met a tenant yet who wouldn't want to save on the power bill that way and we're also getting paid five cents ourselves. So sometimes you can look at it as the developer and say, and it's complicated, you're right, but is it something that I can do? And if I wanna partner with the developer, I'll just lease the land, or is it something that we can say, okay, let's take a run at construction. And what does that mean? We're gonna get a renewable energy credit through some form of a government program, and we're gonna be able to charge our tenants some number for power, and we become the ultimate green developer. So picture that ribbon cutting ceremony. And I haven't met a public official yet that doesn't wanna be at those in towns because you're creating a nice green environment, which is all of the initiatives that you hear in the press today. Uh, the problem with that is it is very complicated to navigate some of those things. Which is why, for example, with the water conversation, there's a company that we hire that does everything for us. We just have to pay yeah. them and they do it, right? So is there something similar on the, for example, we're talking about solar now specifically, are there providers or consultants or developers that basically provide turnkey solutions to landowners or property owners? Oh, sure. There should be one in every state. 
and in in certain states there's going to be multiple ones um that is a simple google search of your locality to see who's there energy consultant solar installation some companies want to just install on the rooftop and have and want to try to the, the stuff i try to stay away from is the companies that want to put on either the single family or the multifamily rooftops the solar not charge reduce the power bill perhaps for the tenants and and then have some form of an agreement where they get paid upon sale or there's some deed restriction that gets put in we, we stay away from those we want to be into a place where it becomes productive for everybody so if you're the operator you're either leasing land or you're leasing the rooftop um, which is always easier than trying to be the constructor and and the operator right or you partner with that constructor operator and a lot of times when you're looking at land and you're looking at apartment buildings not necessarily in the in the cities but you get out in the suburbs you have that residual land the solar developers are happy for you to call and you call one today and say hey i've got 200 to 400 kilowatts that i can put on the ground on two acres they're, they they'll be at your door in 10 minutes because that's typically not what they're good at, right? We're, we're the developers, we're good at finding the land, maybe putting up the buildings, certainly operating them. What they're good at is the solar piece, but that missing link can often be de-risking the land for their installation. Yeah, so we, we this is actually, uh, I've seen kind of a common theme. So we've always kind of explored ways to add revenues uh, reduce expenses across our sites. And so one, one recent thing that we figured out was uh, we found someone with like political ties uh, into our market and they put a billboard up and we lease them the land and then they construct the billboard, they cover all the costs. Uh, we sign like a 20 year lease and then they, they're able to run their ads. And so there's, there's a certain breaking point on like where it becomes profitable for the operator. And I'm just curious, with with your setup is you know are these long term contracts is it a similar setup with with what you guys are doing, um, and at what point does it become profitable on for for you guys? Yeah, so you're you're always trying to look at if you're if we were going to be the installer on the rooftop if we were going to do it, we're going to look first today at where we are. So each state is different. So you do need to under you know you would need to know what state you're in for what renewable energy credits the states give. So in the Northeast, they give a lot. California, they give a lot. It's not necessarily that way everywhere. So you do need to know where you are with what you can get. But the federal tax credit is, in fact, that that investment tax credit is anywhere between 26 and 30 percent for a solar installation today. So for us with a portfolio, if we were going to put one hundred thousand dollars worth of solar on our rooftop, we're going to get a tax credit of twenty six to thirty thousand dollars on that. If we're making money somewhere, that's obviously very good for us. If we're not, we can always sell that tax credit for pick a number in the secondary market, 81, 82 cents to a company that is. And then we just get free cash to go out and buy another property, which is always interesting, depending upon how big that actual tax credit is. A lot of times if we're going to finance that, the financier, the bank is going to say, hey, roll that tax credit in. That's your equity down payment, which is fine. They always like those. But tax credit is a big one. So that's going to reduce the cost of our install. And then we can determine what are we doing with the power? If we're selling it to our tenants at a reduction, we certainly want a five year or sooner payback. So we're going to figure out how many meters we're going to be able to get. Our tenants sign up for it. And now we're going to sell them power at pick a number, 10 cents, 8 cents, wherever we are, depending upon in the country is different numbers. Northeast, very high. You're in teens for, for a kilowatt power. Um, so it, we, we can accelerate the payback here versus if for somewhere else, maybe we can't. So you do have to know where, where you are with that. But I like that five, six year payback it tends to be where most finance sources sit too as far as if you're going to be able to finance it with with a traditional lender. And then certain states have renewable energy lenders, green banks, those kind of things that might give you, you can certainly stare at the government for some of it. You might get some concessions in that space, but 
for me, it's got to be a five or a six year payback or it's just not worth doing. Yeah, I love that. So so what I'm hearing you say is solar is definitely something that we should look into. Uh, it sounds like uh, the minimum that that you need, though, is, you know, two acres of land is what I'm hearing you say. And and how many roofs do you think at one point can you get the the get, get the intention of one of these solar developers? You know, we. It, I, they are um, they're doing things on single family homes today. Oh, wow. So they there there is such an appetite for this, because if you look at things like even what's inside of Build Back Better right now, mm -hmm. if that were to pass the incentives, the, the, there's a there's a pathway, albeit a maze, but there's a pathway for the tax credit to go as high as 40 percent. I mean, think about that. You put in a hundred thousand, you get forty thousand back. That is just that's not sustainable somewhere, right? For all of us. But there's the solar people will make a lot of money in that world. They're talking about even in that where they're gonna pay two to three cents per kilowatt, possibly, for the incentive of putting things on rooftops. Mm. Rooftops are a lot easier than working with on the ground installations because the roof's already there. But you do have to get buy in from the building owner and you do have to make sure it's structurally capable of that. So when you have a portfolio and if you obviously have a small building and you're going rooftop, you're not going to get as much return as if you're spreading it across the portfolio. But uh, any kind of a look at this is worth it for anybody who has any size of a rooftop today to look at and then let the developer help you with what do you do with the power? Do you use it in the building and sell the remaining amount to the grid or do you front of the meter it and sell everything to the grid and get paid on that? And then there's that tax credit to split up. So what if a, a, a common CapEx item that we run into are roofs and there's insurance implications on that after roofs sit for too long, you know, 15 plus years, you're going to, you may run into issues with that. So they have to be replaced Hmm. How does how do you play into something like that? Because eventually your solar you have to remove the solar panels, replace the roof. Like talk to us about that. Yeah. Is, I mean, is there a minimum like roof age that you need to be able to, to pull this off? Well, it's a good point, right? Because if you have um if you have an expectation of a 20-year roof shingle, pick a number. If maybe if you're building new, you might feel comfortable with a 30-year warranty but you're, you have a number for that roof shingle that's going to depreciate on go those panels. And there's a myriad of issues that go with the panel maintenance from the snow, ice, wind, et cetera. So all of that has to be, you have to take all that into consideration based on where you are, if this is practical to do. When you go on the ground, you solve all that, which is why I'm more favorably, I'm happier on the ground always. So if we're gonna go rooftop though, we have to plan for removing those panels to redo that roof on a horizon. So if you and I said, all right, it's 16 years out for sure, but we, we when we pro forma our investment, our money is returned in six years, we're probably okay with that. But we also know the cost of replacing that roof means taking down those panels. Now, it's, it's very possible. The, the interesting thing about panels is for all of us as developers, it, if it's a two foot by four foot panel, let's say, it creates X amount of power. Now, the amount of power it created five years ago on one of those panels is way less than what it creates today. And the promise of tomorrow is more power per panel. So wouldn't it be great if what we were doing now in 15 years if we put 40 panels up today, right, in 15 years, we only had to do four. So we're taking down those old panels to put up new roof shingles, but we're also only putting up a tenth of the panels that we did the first time to generate the same amount of power. So the, the horizon for the technology is very interesting. And you guys have probably also seen, and I haven't worked any of these out yet because we're just in, in too much of a, of a climate here for it, but the roof shingles with the solar inside them. Yeah, I've seen that. I think Tesla is, is, is having that right now. Yeah. That's, that is cool. Not to be minimized, right? I mean, right, somebody else will work, work it out. Let's see if it makes sense. And why wouldn't we build with those if they do? All right, so what you're saying is if you have any kind of roofs or any kind of land, uh, start looking for solar developers 
Is that what mm -hmm. you're, that's yeah. what you Google for and yeah. reach, reach out to them and see if you can in interest them. The other thing I'm hearing, if you have any kind of land left over, maybe align yourself with a permitting expert to see how we can change the use of that, 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 that land to do something else with it. Uh, maybe. Well, and the developer will help you. I mean, I'll give you a live example. Today, we we ended up with a residual non-conforming piece of land attached to a multifamily site. That was 1.4 acres. I called the solar company we work with today, and they're designing me the, the small little 200 kilowatt solar farm on that property to feed power to the multifamily for free. Nice. They're Because they want me to buy the panels from them. Yeah, so yeah, as yeah. you build that relationship, you start to get some of the benefits. And now yeah. that intel is so important to all of us. I mean, how how you guys and us, we plan our businesses. What do we have in front of us for intel? What can we do? So if somebody's handing us a map saying, hey, you can put on 400 panels. You can get this amount of power out of it. This is the pro forma. This is the payback. Here's the tax credit. Those are decisions you can make rapidly now versus if you're trying to wait and guess and you don't have that kind of intel you you'll never know what your numbers are that's where your mistakes get made so one one really good point about all of this is that once you figure out a strategy i mean just as long as your uh, acquisitions and as long as the properties that you're picking up are somewhat similar uh, in their land use and and their function you can replicate the process over and over again. Uh, obviously there's some caveats to that, but for example, you know, we're, we do the, the low flow toilets, all of our sites, we bake that into our model, we budget for it and it's there every single time. And so uh, once you kind of get the groundwork done on something, it sounds like uh, in a situation like this and you know it works and you trust it and, and you tried it, you can go in and, and do it again and again, uh, which is, is super cool. So my other question on that is uh, for you, John, is how long does it take to actually implement this from inception? Because people have different hold times for their projects. And so if, you, if you're like, well, it takes three years and people are only doing a two year hold, it may not be for them, but talk to us about that. Yeah, sure. So the smaller the system, the faster it goes. If we're, if we're doing that little 200 kilowatt system that I just spoke to you about before, we'll apply into one of the state incentive programs. We'll probably get an answer if we have won an award for higher payments for our power by April. Our permits would get pulled. We'd probably start construction in July. It's about a six week build. We're probably operational, interconnected and cash flowing by October. Hmm. So six months that. roughly, six, yeah, six months it, roughly. That's that's amazing. Now we have a, a two megawatt on the ground solar farm that we're doing now, which takes the power, stores it in a battery, and mm -hmm. then releases it to the grid when there's more demand in the in the peak demand part mm -hmm. of the grid to make more money, right? Yeah. That's on 10 acres. Mm -hmm. That's going to be more like a year to a year and a half. Right. Because by the time we get that permitted, built, interconnected, it just takes more time because it's bigger, but it's 10 times bigger. So the bigger, the bigger one's a year and a half, the smaller one's six months. Yeah. So as, as we kind of wind down here, we talked about solar a lot. It sounds like you're very excited about solar and it seems like it's a, it's a pretty big opportunity. Is there anything else that we should uh, maybe talk about before we wrap things up? Anything, uh, anything that we should think about and look into uh, regarding this? The renewable energy, you know, it's interesting what, what we found, and you may you may share this too. There's a certain tenant out there today that really likes that. And you can market your building if you're, especially some of the stuff you guys are doing. When you start to get into the inner cities, it's hard to make money on a rooftop with solar. But in the suburbs, you have that little bigger spread out, maybe that garden variety building. You have that residual land, which you can use. And you can market your building in that little niche where you have a commitment to green and to the renewable energy concepts and certain tenants will pay you for that. And you might find that you can actually get a little bump in your rent for that because of that little niche. And it also helps pay for it. It depends where you are. Certain states are going to profile different, but 
whoever is listening, you want to look at where you are to see if that's a niche that you might find other people aren't in that you could take advantage of. We've seen it work. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, John, this, is, this has been uh, super awesome. Thanks for bringing us some of these ideas. I always love new ideas like that. How can people connect with you? I um, am easy to reach through, through a couple different places. Um, my core development company is Jay Healy Development. We're at jhealydevelopment.com. And then we have software that helps people pro forma these type of decisions on buildings and what to do in energy space or what to do before speaking to a bank at leveragecalc.com. Either one's a great place to, to find me and anybody that we can help, we're, uh, we're here to do so in your audience. That's great, John. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. No, it's great, guys. Thank you.